want to just tell you a little bit about the Science Gateway Community Institute, which supports this webinar. We are here funded by the National Science Foundation to provide both online and face-to-face -face resources and services to the community of people building gateways. And really what that's about is, is building a community around um, the people who have experience and know about technology and understand best practices and so forth in a way that's um, ultimately sustainable for all of us. Uh, so that is partly why we have um, AWS here today, because this is a terrific resource and uh, technology. So um, I'll tell you just a little bit about our five service areas at the Science Gateways Community Institute. The first one is our incubator, and it, it serves two functions. One is to provide consultants about very specific areas that have to do with gateway building or um, maintenance or um, sustainability. Uh, and also they offer a week-long intensive boot camp that you can participate in. It's a, a free event, uh, and all it costs you is basically a little bit of travel time, uh, or travel cost and your time, of course. Extended developer support also provides consulting, and that is with hands-on development help uh, for your gateway. Um, and it can be either implementing an entire gateway and getting it started, or it could be creating some function that's specific. Uh, the Scientific Software Collaborative has created a gateways catalog, which lists both existing gateways as well as software components that, um, that you can make use of, or you can look at the gateways to see examples of what might be something you'd want to create. Um, both are ways that it's been used, and we also encourage you, if you have a gateway, to list it in that, in that catalog, yeah, or if you have software as well. Community engagement and exchange is uh, the area that I'm in, and we bring you the webinars as well as an annual conference, which will be next uh, year in September in San Diego, um, as well as materials on the website. So um, if, you, if you have resources that you want to share, if you'd like to present a webinar, please do get in touch with us. And finally, workforce development is our area that um, provides professional development opportunities for students and young professionals um, through internships and um, attendance at conferences and hackathons and whatnot. So with that, that is basically SGCI in a nutshell. Um, we'd like to just remind you that because we are a, a free service, but we're supported by the National Science Foundation. We like to be able to show them that people have been attending and have questions and enjoyed this. So if you can give us 30 seconds of feedback at the end, we have two really quick questions about how much you like the webinar, as well as an opportunity to suggest additional topics. So with that, I'm going to stop sharing my screen, and um, Don is going to take over. Um, and I would like to... Um, uh, introduce Don. I'm very pleased that he can join us today. We may be lucky enough to also have his colleague Kevin join us who is in travel limbo, um, but he's going to be talking about the Am Amazon Web Services Cloud for Gateways, and uh, Don brings uh, experience from working for um, about 20 years at least, I guess, in uh, working with university research customers in high performance computing as well as research data storage management. So uh, with that, I'm going to let him tell you anything more that he wants to say about himself, um, but I'm really looking forward to this and um, I hope you enjoy it too. Thank you very much. Everybody can hear me fine? We can hear you great. Great, perfect. So, and everybody's seeing the screen with Amazon Cloud Resources. It's a part of scientific workflows, hopefully. Yes, yep, we see okay, it. Okay, great. Very good. So I have more slides than I need here, and we might skip around just a little bit, but we really want to take a look at the AWS Cloud capabilities, especially for research and how they relate to science gateways. And I think this is the best presentation for that. I've got another one that's actually maybe even more fun. It gets a little uh, a little crazier, but uh, I think this is the one that applies the best for for the uh, for the topics we're talking about and, and hopefully some discussion around them as well. So and I apologize, my partner in crime, uh, Kevin Jurison, is having uh, travel <laughs> issues. Uh, obviously we've got some weather going on across the country and he's uh, he's experiencing some travel issues. He may still pop in, maybe not. We uh, will continue and carry forward. But 
I did want to put his intro slide up because Kevin is indicative of the type of resources we have to bring to bear. Kevin does a lot of uh, hands-on um, um, help and assistance with, with people like Berkeley's Rise Lab and in other situations. I know he was down in, in uh in South America, doing some work with a uh, with a very very large uh, uh, customer that's looking at um, extreme uh, petabytes of information and uh, passing that around the world for for scientific for a scientific workflow. Uh, Kevin has his PhD in physics and uh, he's done a, a, a lot of great work. Um, we have people like Kevin and uh, another a whole cadre of people like him that that have scientific specialties and apply that specialty in in their science workflow in AWS cloud capabilities and they're extremely extremely useful. Uh, and then. You end up with people like myself that have about 20 years in the industry and some practical experience around putting in HPC clusters and uh, research data management systems. Uh, 20 years ago, I got involved in higher education, and I've been doing it ever since, especially in high-performance computing. At the time, it was called Beowulf Computing, but back then, I was a systems engineer installing systems and, and, uh, and clusters, and I've been doing that ever since for people like Cray and Penguin Computing and Data Direct Networks and Dell. And that's my picture. When I'm not playing with computers, I play with horses. <laughs> All right, let's take a look at what's happening just lately. Uh, and here we, we're going to take a look at a couple of the things that have been done on AWS Cloud in the research community. Uh, and one of the things that we like to emphasize is what our customers are doing. Uh, AWS is a, a very pragmatic company when it comes to what we implement and the features that, that we develop. And by pragmatic, I mean that they're based on customer needs. Uh, so we pull always the, the research community looking for what the research community really wants. Uh, and, and no surprise to this audience, uh, one of the things where we see a lot of um, emphasis, a lot of uh, a need for for development is around science workflows and gate, I'm sorry, excuse me, science gateways and uh, and workflows around them. Um, so we like to emphasize what our customers are doing. And in this case, the Australian researchers were having an issue with uh, koala po koala populations declining. Obviously, the koala is a, a symbol of Australia, Australia, and and that's a big concern to them. They came to AWS many years ago and uh, looked at developing their genome pipeline on AWS. Uh, we did that using Spot Market and, and helping them out in the very beginning. And since then, they've developed all kinds of interesting um, discoveries around the koala and their diet and why they're declining and what they can do to, uh, to alleviate that. Uh, and then another thing hot off the press that we've done recently, and this will be coming around actually, and I encourage anybody to go out and, and take a look at uh, the reInvent conference that will happen the last week of November, first of December time frame. Uh, but in summer, we had the AWS Public Summit, Public Sector Summit. And if you look at each one of these lines, these are all presentations and customer presentations that were done at the AWS Summit. And this runs the gamut from, from machine learning, which is obviously a big topic, to life sciences and precision medicine, to what NASA is doing with AWS, to you know, all kinds of other different areas. You know, PNNL is up there for the Pacific Northwest uh, National Lab. And then there's um, uh, Clemson was on here. They're under one of these. Um, but you can see that it just runs, runs a gamut from, from earth sciences around the geoscience to life sciences to machine learning to all kinds of different areas. And uh, so this kind of gives you a broad spectrum of, of what we're doing and what our customers are doing. This, I think, correlates very well into the community of, of the uh, Science Gateways Community Institute in that you guys cover such a broad spectrum as well. Another one, we uh, uh, go with 16 data using AWS Managed Services. This is another one that was introduced at, uh, at AWS Summit. Uh, we had the customer on online talking about exactly what they did and what their workflow was around um, uh, the ZAR files that they were that they were processing. 
And then here's one where we went through uh, uh, taking some very large data sets um, and doing machine learning around them. And these are Earth observation imagery. Uh, and it was taking not just the Earth observation observation imagery, but applying it to uh, data around the, uh, the energy grid and being able to trace what correspondence was between uh, that imagery and, and what was going on inside the, uh, inside the power grid. Uh, That's another application that was, that was developed on AWS and, and presented at AWS Public Sector Summit. So Let's take a couple of the key strengths um, that that AWS provides for scientific discoveries. Uh, one is just agility. Uh, if you look at what we can provide for cloud services, we can speed time to discovery. Uh, and there's a couple different ways that we do that. One is through fast experimentation. Um, if you think of what the process is to acquire to fund, acquire, and uh, run a, uh, a resource uh, online, or I'm sorry, on-premise, uh, it, uh, it is much easier, obviously, to do that in the cloud and take advantage of resources that are available immediately. Um, and that's talking, and then as you scale and right-size a, a workflow, uh, that agility is available in the cloud, uh, usually uh, better than on than on-premise cluster systems. Collaboration, uh, whether it's a data lake model or widespread sharing, uh, in one of the areas that we also see a big uptake in cloud services is around security and compliance. Um, I've talked with many university security compliance officers uh, and understand their headaches of raw involved around whether it's uh, patient and life science data around HIPAA or our defense uh, regulated data or if it's uh, one of the NIST uh, compliance models, uh, security and compliance can become onerous uh, when done either on campus or, or uh, and we uh, take care of that in almost all of our services inside the cloud. So that becomes a, uh, it becomes a process issue at the local level, and it becomes a technology issue on our side. So we can handle we can handle that from at least the the technical and data on storage uh, component area. Um, and then uh, then just around infrastructure, machine learning, and analytics, and the capabilities and the services that are built around those on the cloud, uh, usually are a little bit more fleshed out. It's funny when you look at technology that's introduced later or is a little bit younger, uh, that uh, maturity on the cloud is much more so than stuff that was done actually 30 years ago that has a, that has a good workflow already on premise and in clusters that are, that are available on campuses. So let's take a look at this real quick. Um, too long, did not read. <laughs> too long, did not listen to Don for uh, you know, the next 50 more minutes. Uh, the big three things to take away with, uh, AWS collaborates with the research community on the biggest research challenges, uh, whether it be you know, the large hydrogen collider and everything they're going to do with that over the next five years uh, to 10 years in the, in the high luminosity area, or if it's, or if it's something that's uh, really large to, um, in the uh, earth sciences community and obviously we do a lot of work and it's further down in the presentation here with nasa and their large data sets uh, so we collaborate in each one of those uh, but also there are ways to collaborate through materials with just a singular research software engineer on a project. And we'll talk about that in a little bit too. So whether it's a large scale collaboration or if it's actually just providing tools and, and uh, resources for the, for the singular research software engineer, I think we cover a gamut between, uh, between both sides. And then secondly, uh, one of the big takeaway messages is that AWS Cloud has scale. It's got services as data capabilities beyond the research infrastructure. And uh, I helped actually put in a lot of the NSF, not a lot, but let's say I, I did contribute to some of the <laughs> NSF resources 
uh, especially exceed resources that are uh, that are out there. I certainly know them well, and and working for Cray and DDN and and Dell and uh, a few others, uh, it certainly helped put those in, and I know their capabilities. Uh, but maybe the scale, the availability, uh, might be up a level in the uh, AWS cloud resources. So then the last thing is we have something called the Research Cloud Program inside AWS. And this eases the on-ramp for taking a uh, uh, either just a research project or a large-scale science workflow um, into the cloud. Uh, part of that is the people itself, like Kevin and myself and, and the whole team of, of people that extends uh, into the dozens. Um, or it uh, might be certain material that we produce as well that helps that out, and we'll talk about that as well. I don't know if you guys have ever seen the the researcher's handbook, but that's one of the uh, uh, things that the, our our team produces. The researcher's handbook is actually a you know a couple hundred page document that goes into taking somebody who's never logged into AWS before through the process of setting up a research project. And I assume we could provide that link um, afterwards? Most assuredly. Yeah. Fantastic. Yep. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So what can we build together? Uh, we have actively put tools in the hands of research software engineers. We uh, help that community out a lot. Uh, we were just at their last meeting, I think, in London or somewhere. I was not there, but uh, actually I think Kevin went to it. Uh, and we help out the community in that way. Uh, I'm not going to read bullet by bullet. I'm going to pick out ones that, uh, that might be more applicable to this community. Uh, uh, we set, have set up DMZs in the public cloud. Uh, if you're looking at data transfer and have questions around that, uh, we have worked with Internet2. We have worked with ESNet on different projects. Uh, we know that is that can be a, a barrier to adopting AWS cloud and uh, any public cloud provider. We've looked at that very stringently. I've got a whole other presentation on it that we talk about on, on best practices around uh, data transfer, because in a true hybrid, in a true hybrid computing model between when you're doing on-premise and and public cloud, um, the data management capabilities and especially data transfer capabilities need to be fleshed out, and we we certainly understand that and help you with it. Um, And we we do we we want if you read that middle bullet item we do want to build new programs and systems with you. Um, I am actively working on plans to do that for the next year and you know continue to do what we're doing for this year. But then I think the scope is going to increase for next year, and I'm I'm looking forward to that. And uh, this community is certainly is certainly one of the one of the most uh, valuable that are out there. Right, I'm going to continue on. So this is actually where Kevin would jump in because Kevin's done a lot of the work with UC Berkeley around the RISE lab. And uh, uh, he, they, the RISE lab has developed open source platforms running on AWS. Um, for a lot of the analytics work that they're doing. Uh, and they look at, uh, and I think they've applied this to many different different areas. And I apologize because Kevin could delve into this very deeply. Um, but it, they lose all, use all of the tools that you see down in the bottom left, uh, all of those running on AWS. Um, and there is a link there to show that you can um, travel to to uh, see everything that they do. Um, one of the things that that AWS cloud services are extremely good for is the taking of uh, live data. It might be from an Internet of Things. Uh, it might be from different sensors that are out in the environment. And being able to apply analytics uh, on the fly. Some people call this serverless computing. Uh, it is capable capabilities that are built around uh, things like AWS Lambda that that provide a way to do uh, analysis and uh, even computation without without setting up 
a, a, a compute resource inside AWS. So you can take live data, make real-time decisions on it as it's in flight, and uh, and kind of uh, skip over a step or two in a in a in a workflow a lot of times. I think we have more slides on that further back, so I'm not going to do it too much. Um, another question collaboration. Up. Yes. I just gonna, mm -hmm. A question popped up. He said, have you th been thinking about the medical science DMZ for clinical data? Yes. Um, yes, we have. Uh, as a matter of fact, I wonder if the question is um, in relation to uh, NIH's data commons or if it's more um, granular than that. But uh, we certainly do. Um, and it, it's funny, the scope can get bigger or smaller based on, on what we're looking at, because we certainly are looking at, you've seen the news and you've seen uh, the, uh, the take that, that Amazon, uh, I'm talking about Amazon as well as AWS, uh, are looking at for, for personal medicine, for medicine uh, improvements. Uh, and but, uh, you know, that's on a huge, gigantic scale. So we're looking at that, obviously. But then we're also doing projects like the NIH Data Commons that provides a, a very large data set of uh, research data and, and capabilities around that built on top of the cloud. But then we're also looking at uh, smaller, more granular uh, science DMZs. So whether the nature of the, I'm not sure whether to take the, that answer based on the nature of the question, but yes, um, we are. <laughs> Bill, Bill could probably pipe up with more. Um, that, uh, um, but in the meantime, also um, Ishwar asked, and I know Ishwar is associated with NIH, um, mm -hmm. affiliated with, he asked, could you share more about the NIH data commons? Um, yes. Um, yeah, as a matter of fact, I think there's a slide in it back through here. So. Let me look real quick, because I can look on this other screen here and see if it's up coming up. Or I might be thinking of the other presentation, because I reference there's two of them. Yeah, I apologize, I don't see the slide there. Um, so what we're doing with the NIH Data Commons, uh, you know, it's a very large project, uh, provides a commons area for NIH-funded uh, research to provide a copy of their data. Uh, that data, uh, and I'm not intimately involved in the project, so I might get a, you know, I may not be able to um, profile it exactly, uh, or not exactly, but um, intricately. But that data then is, uh, I think, is either, I've read this, so the is either public or not, uh, and it allows multiple researchers to access if it is. Um, uh, if get, I can go in further if I had the slide, but off the top of my head, no. I, I think I'm, that's about where I want to, where I want to rest. I can certainly find more information, and I'm going to take a note of that. And I can put you two in touch with each other as well, which I'll yeah. do. And we yes. have, we obviously have people that are very intimately involved in that one. And uh, so, so, th so this is Bill. Maybe I can just ask real quick. Um, so, you know, to do a, a medical science DMZ, basically a DMZ that supports uh, EPHI. You just need to be, you know, you just need to have a, those kind of protocols in place and be able to support, uh, you know, high-speed transmission of data. Um, and if you guys are an endpoint for us as an institution that wants to consume your services, then it's easy for us to, you know, move large data, particularly, you know, clinical genomic data onto your right. platform. So that's kind of really my question. Okay. I got that. And... Uh... That was um, Bill Barnett, by the way, from Indiana. Okay. Yeah. Yes, thank you. And then uh, I'll put you in touch with Ishwar, who's also okay. had a question. Mm -hmm. Perfect. I'm probably going to put you in touch with Sanjay and, uh, because he is now um, running the NIH program for us, and he'll be able to either answer or he'll be able to direct that question better than I. Okay. Great. Thanks. Yep. We'll let you carry on. All right. 
So a little bit about around partnerships with funding, research funding agencies. We do work with the NSF directly at the program level. Uh, the person I just mentioned, Sanjay Padai, works in D.C., based out of Boston, but he's in D.C. a lot working with the NSF programs. And uh, one of the ones we, we did was the NSF Big Data Program. It's obviously a very large program that you know, goes out in many directions, but uh, we've certainly been able to apply AWS Research Initiative to it. Um, and we are looking at other ones as well. So down the pike, uh, whether it's Exceed or whether it's other programs, uh, other uh, areas of the NSF, we're, uh, we're obviously looking to, uh, to help out as well. Uh, here's the Cancer Institute Cloud Resources. We are you know, working with the National Cancer Institute. This gets into a little bit of what we were talking before. Um, this actually was a slide I think I was thinking about with the uh, with the work we did with the Cancer Genome Atlas and uh, therapeutically applicable research called Target, and this uses the Genomic Data Commons, which I think is a subset of that. Uh, it is a, a GDC instance with the University of Chicago that we worked here. Yeah, there it is, Research Data Commons. There's the slide that I was thinking of, and I couldn't couldn't come up with it before. Um, I think I'm going to leave this for for Sanjay and for you guys to follow up on. Um, honestly, I think that's probably the best way to handle that question and, and to work into that. But it, you know, we do obviously support secure user authentication and authorization. Uh, there's metadata validation tools built into here, um, and the environment provides you know, user workspaces to analyze, share. It supports all the typical frameworks you can think of and, and tools to use um, for that analysis and that work. Uh, there's a lot of work that goes into this, and uh, and uh, uh, we've you know we've allowed it to uh, to use our elastic compute resources and uh, and uh, it, it's it becomes the cloud actually has AWS cloud has become I think uh, a very good tool for this type of work based on based on what we've seen so far I'm gonna jump ahead real quick because I want to we're at the, we're clicking close to the 25 minute mark. I'm going to jump ahead to some of the reasons why people use AWS. I'll keep it short because I don't want to talk about AWS a whole lot. I do want to, I do want to apply it though to uh, what might work best with the Science Gateways uh, Community Institute. So up first is uh, just a quick why AWS. One is scale. Uh, you know, when, you, when do you get the capability to use 500,000 cores on your system that you have available to you? Uh, if you need to do some type of batch, kind of loosely coupled application that can scale out to you know, 500,000 cores or you know, a million virtual cores uh, and provide that type, of, that type of capability within, a, within a, a shorter time frame than what you could do with something uh, locally. That instance was done here with Clemson. Amy and her group uh, ran a natural language processing uh, or application, and uh, using Spot was able to. Uh, and Spot, if you don't know what that is, it's uh, it's using the cycles that are free at the moment inside of a AWS compute instance. So you can you can define your EC2 instance and say whenever it's available at a reduced price, run the uh, run this application. Here you can see that using spot instances, we went over 500,000 cores, a million virtual cores, uh, and uh, completed that natural language processing and uh, application in a, a very short time. We had the help of uh, Omnibond and their, and their uh, cloudy cluster uh, partner uh, in their application to run this and, and to manage it. And then just a month ago, we did the same thing with Unifa in another application, another uh, instance where we once again used Spot and at a, a significantly reduced cost, ran over a million a million cores. I think came this up was before you went into yeah. this section was about uh, metadata tools. Um, 
so I, I don't know if it's going to be addressed maybe later. So I thought I'd jump in. The question uh, was, do, do the metadata tools work with uh, ESRI metadata, metadata structure, ESRI? Good question. I don't know. Uh, I have to check. Okay. And I think that would, I th I'm almost positive that would be a question for the either the partner we use on the research data management side or what we build into it. And uh, and I would have to check on on which one. It was a question around a certain um, a certain application, a certain workflow. It just says, do the metadata tools work with? Esri metadata structure. So maybe um, Jay okay. Carter could put some more information about that. Another question popped up, uh, and I think it's related to the spot um, use mm -hmm. usage. Is is there a guaranteed time window to provision a compute instance? For example, a person wants to run a job on twenty thousand cores, real, not virtual. I think I should know this, and I think there is, but. I'm, I'm actually envisioning the screen in my head right now as I'm answering this. And I think it's a little more nuanced than that. Because when you when you set a time frame up, and I'm trying to think if that's a screen on spot or if that's a screen on, screen on reserved, uh, I'm going to have to get back to you. I don't want to answer incorrectly. Okay. I can put you in touch with a minute. Uh, yeah, I I think I know, but I, I don't want to say and, and have you go off and, and take my word on that one. Great. Yeah, because I think I'm mixing up the screen with reserve. So you can do on demand, which, you know, the pricing goes up and on, up and down based on demand of the cycles you're, you're looking for and the size and everything. Uh, then you can do reserved. Reserve certainly has a, a, a set price for uh, whenever you want, and you can reserve instances, and the spot is take it as you get it. Take cycles as you need them, and they're available. And I thought there was a time window on that, but let me get a definitive answer. Okay. Um, a, yep. a, a related question to that is, um, uh, let's say you submit a job, which doesn't happen to run immediately. On HPC system, usually the schedulers will tell me what is the anticipated time something will run. Mm -hmm. There's something like that available on AWS. Yes, so there's many ways to set up a, uh, a job and run it. You can certainly use Slurm and HD Condor or you know, favorite scheduler inside AWS. You can run config cluster, CFN cluster uh, in AWS. CFN cluster, I don't think does that. Um, so, so my question is not about Slurm or anything. My question yeah. is about availability. Slurm or a cluster cannot do anything unless you know the real hardware is available. Right. That's my question. So it's again provisioning is the question, right? I mean, yeah. we don't know what the scale of Amazon is, and I believe Amazon doesn't tell how big. Nope thing is, yet the, the Amazon does tell us it's really big, bigger than anything else, but uh, kind of uh, we, the user has a fault dichotomy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, it's funny. I, actually, I, on that one, it'd be fun to actually take a look at the screen itself as setting up a cluster and, and waiting for our, our workload. Um, let's get back to you on that one. Can I get your name? It's Amit Chaurasi at SDSC. And I can, okay. yeah, and I can um, put you guys in touch too. All okay. right, super, thanks. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, this one, actually, the Univo one, uh, uh, while well, we did this on there, we also uh, work with Slurm, HD Condor, and you know, all the typical other schedulers. This is a, a one we did, and it's the usage pattern of uh, the chart that we did with uh, uh, this one's Brookhaven uh, with CERN and, and the LHC we were, when they were actually looking for the Higgs boson particle. Uh, 
they had a 58,000 spot cores elastically. So once they started, you can see the immediate ramp up uh, in that graph and usage model through it. I think we're still on scale under the Y AWS. One of the other things is the, uh, oh, this is the, just a little bit on Atlas and the architecture and how they use the AWS um, capabilities across Europe to Brookhaven and then the different uh, data centers for us. Let me make sure we jump over here to Uh, by the way, this was uh, in conjunction with ESNet. Or this one, a lot of this was inside the country. Um, this is certainly one that, that we've done a lot of work with with NASA. Uh, whether it's this one or some of the other earth science areas we've done, uh, climate research, we've done a, a, a lot of work with NASA. Um, this is uh, the one I wanted to click on. Here's one we did with uh, a genomics processing, with uh, this time not with uh, regular CPUs or, or GPUs, but this time with FPGA accelerators. And this is with Children's Hospital of Philadelphia and Etico Genome. Uh, and what we did was the fastest ever analysis of 1,000 genomes and won an award for that. Um, and it tells you a little bit about spot pricing down there and that we did it for about $24 per genome. I'll just say, wow, just because everyone else is muted. <laughs> That's pretty cool. And one of the, one of the other uh, things around YW, AWS is just the, and I talked about it a little bit earlier, was around collaboration and the capabilities of sharing data and just the, the extreme scale around that. And here's one where we uh, have loaded up the NASA image and video library. Uh, and it scales out as needed. Uh, it goes as, goes out uh um, to the scale that, that NASA is looking at. And, and uh, I was funny, I was working on some other stuff right now, and uh, it might get, <clears throat> excuse me, might get much, much bigger. Um, uh, so one of the things that, uh, that they've certainly proved, I, can't put, I don't think we can put the numbers behind it, but the, the cost savings around um, deploying this in the AWS cloud versus uh, um, in-house and on-premise were, were not realized. Uh, another customer where we've done um, a lot of data around um, uh, meteorological data, and this one is very interesting in that it uh, it and lose, uses our elastic cache for uh, peak demands, but it also uses Lambda uh, to respond to uh, database events and in-app in activity. Um, uh, and they have, I think, an exabyte of data, if I remember correctly. Obviously, climate data is, is, is uh, uh, very large and um, And uh, their um, data storage uh, reduced solution costs by about 50%. So based across their you know, exabyte of data, that uh, becomes a lot. Uh, probably the biggest use on this, I think, was around big data analytics around the, around the uh, meteorological data. A uh, quick thing on innovation. Um, so as new research projects come on board and new capabilities are needed every four to five years, uh, the typical RFP process takes about as long as you see in the chart there between evaluation and uh, clarification contracting. I've been a part of this world for you know, some 20 years. I know it. I know a lot of the uh, the process uh, and been been exposed to it many times, and uh, you know, over 500 and 
and some odd days is the typical life cycle of a uh, RFP to acquire and, and bring a system up in production. The bottom one is public cloud uh, acquisition and gaining a application running. So you can see there's a little difference in, in innovation and time to time to getting work done. So where is the benchmark comparison for the previous timeline for the cloud? The bottom. That benchmarks are omitted, actually. Oh, your benchmarks. Yeah. Yes. So I think yeah. it's unfair to kind of, you know, have a laundry list of things for that, and then for cloud, magically, those requirements go away. Yeah. No, I, I take your point there. Yeah. Uh, benchmarks could be added in there. So is project management, which has nothing to do with one or the other. Uh huh. This was taken from. Uh, bah, bah, bah. Uh, I'll get the footnote on that because this was actually taken from somewhere. Yeah, it says the Will Mayer uh, top right, but it's still still not right comparison. Yeah. Would you agree though that the RFP process takes a year to two years? But that's an agency thing. It has nothing to do with the provider. Uh -huh. Yeah, I know. The uh, one of the most interesting issues is the and 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 if it were to be a public cloud, to the RFP timeframe would not change regardless. Yeah, so I agree. There are some areas where they would not. Um, there, uh, there's a comment in here too from. Yep. Someone named Drew Lesky who says, uh, I think project management probably applies to the project of getting the equipment in and deployed. Um, yeah, certainly. If you look at contracting and then commissioning the system, uh, it's funny what you just mentioned, that project management area where clarification contracting, I think this could be better, obviously. Uh, there could be a, a situation where you have a step in here called award. I think project management is the acquisition cycle, uh, building uh, everything else that goes along with the, the physical implementation of a system. No, I think you have a point that, you know, public clouds can, you know, uh, get going sooner, but I don't think it's this, the, the, this, this comparison is fair by any means. Okay, point taken. Uh, I'll look at this. It's funny, we have this slide in multiple uh, presentations, and I think it might be a little bit different in one of the other ones. So you know, I'll take a look at that for you and, um, and see. But you're right, I agree with you that there should be a benchmarking step added into uh, the public cloud one. Bottom line, though, I think we, we can uh, bring up a system much faster, bring up a, a workload much faster on for a singular researcher. I mentioned, um, I do want to mention this again around YAWS, and one is uh, the, the need for compliance and security around data and processes. Because uh, what's interesting is when I talk to universities and I do talk to compliance and security officers and, you know, in my past I, I helped put in on-premise data storage systems that included uh, compliance and security capabilities and I know how much they raise the cost of on-premise on, on storage systems. Um, if you look at the AWS cloud, every one of these is taken care of within our data centers and our capabilities, our services uh, around each one of these for the data and the compute of data uh, within the public cloud. But obviously, there's process issues at the on-premise and on the on-campus level and transfer data transfer uh, issues that we have to look at as well, but uh, when data is residing in and, and computation occurs inside the AWS cloud, uh, it's taken care of on all of these. And uh, GDPR is included on the Europe one as well. I need to add that logo on there. All 
all of this is running within the AWS GovCloud. We have a special, we have a special uh, GovCloud that takes care of the capabilities for the U.S. government security compliance uh, areas as well. Uh, we talked a little bit about scale. Uh, this is the typical how big we are scale. Uh, this is the AWS global infrastructure. Each one of those are regions and number of avail excuse me availability zones around the world. And we're continually looking at customer demand and placing new ones uh, where they are needed. Uh, all of these are uh, um, utilizing our you know, CloudFront for our content delivery network and Route 53 for DNS operations. Um, uh, there's, what, 16 regions and I think 42 availability zones. There might be actually a little bit more now. This slide was this summer. Uh, I don't think we've opened another one, but we might have. Um, I think we're supporting 190 different countries now. Something to that effect. And all of this is being able to be done, obviously, through web browser command line interfaces. And then we have GUIs platforms. And I left that slide in there just because that was in there before. It wasn't something I added recently, but science gateways as well. Uh, personally, I see science gateways as uh, one of the ways that really can leapfrog and jump the capabilities for research communities. Um, and uh, not just, I'm not talking just for AWS cloud right now, but just in general. Uh, because what we see, I'm going to go off the tangent just a little bit, what we see um, in AWS research usage on the cloud is that uh, many singular researchers uh, spin up workloads on the on the AWS cloud, and they do it um, one because of ease of use and availability, uh, scalability somewhat. But a lot of times these projects are are not as huge as as the ones we talk about in the in the case study slides before. But the capabilities are there to just come up very very quickly. But at the same time, they need things like the researcher's handbook that we provide to do that. But the science gateways capabilities around that, and if there's an environment and a uh, ecosystem built around the work that they're trying to do that a science gateway can provide, that certainly will um, alleviate the, uh, the uh, uh, barriers of, of trying to get work done. And we provide that on AWS Cloud. That's one of the things we're looking at doing more and more of. Uh, this gets into a little bit around the capabilities. Uh, there are storage options that are available. Here, we're, we're talking more about just the, the basics of what AWS can provide at this point. Um, and EFS and uh, EC2 and block storage, EBS is Elastic Block Storage or Elastic uh, File Storage. And then, of course, everybody has heard about our Amazon S3 capabilities. It was, I think, the very first service that was available was uh, Amazon S3, which is, you know, just being able to store your files in the cloud. Uh, it is object-based storage, scalable to uh, very, very large systems. And then there's uh, Amazon Glacier as well, and Glacier is for long-term storage that would be tiered off as an archive uh, target. Uh, the EFS and EBS and EC2 are used uh, in conjunction with each other in typical HPC workloads. If you think of uh, HPC as uh, high performance computing as, as the typical triangle of, uh, of data storage and file systems and data IO access coupled with compute, coupled with uh, a fabric of uh, some high speed, low latency type. Uh, that is, is what we're providing as well as you do on campus in the AWS cloud. A typical data flow that we can look at is ingress, egress, data transfer. You have all of those different capabilities that you see in the middle under data transfer. Uh, as I said before, data transfer can be a barrier 
sometimes for people. So we do help them out with that, and we have do do have capabilities around working with internet too, and and uh, and, and points of presence out in the out in the community, uh, especially with the educational uh, networks that are out there, the regional educational networks. Once inside AWS Cloud, we provide the object block and file storage, and you can run things like Lustre and GPFS inside of AWS Cloud uh, and do compute in the different many different instances around CPUs and, and GPUs and FPGAs and whatever's needed for the certain application. We'll talk about ingress and egress, especially egress, just a little bit more in just a second because I know there's usually questions around around costs of egress. We do have a, a program that provides researchers um, a reduction in data egress um, capabilities. I'm sorry, pricing, data egress. Excuse me, reduction in data egress pricing. Here's just a real quick spectrum of the compute instance types. All of these are available based on whatever the workload demands. Uh, machine learning certainly takes care of some of them, uh, makes use of some more than others. Uh, analytics, once again, will use others versus uh, other ones. Uh, medical, or I'm sorry, imaging in general, whether it's medical imaging or geospatial or anything, will take care of, well, can be based on uh, something as well. So GPUs, FPGAs, CPUs, and then the different uh, different general compute ones all have their place in whatever workload that uh, that might be directed at uh, at the AWS cloud. And uh, we have libraries of benchmarks on you know if you if you're a, a loosely coupled kind of a batch operation certainly we have benchmarks over in this area that might help out if we are imaging we you know obviously might have we do have benchmarks that that are available that we've done and we can certainly look at doing benchmarks in, if you have a certain workload that you want to test on on you know whether it's GPUs or FPGAs so one of the interesting things and one of the people one of the reasons they they people do look at AWS cloud is to test new technology under under workloads that they may not have access to in their on premise systems We're at 48 minutes. I'm going to jump ahead to things that AWS Research Group does. Because I'm jumping ahead my, over some my, uh, things. My like clock actually gives, gives you, yeah. Uh, yeah, we have, we um, it's about six more minutes to the top of the hour, actually. So it's less time okay. than you thought. Yeah. But you're welcome right. to go, you know, as long as you need uh, to, the, I mean, as close to the top there as you like. <laughs> We're not going to go as long as I want. No. Um, <laughs> no, I do want to mention open data. Here's a real quick uh, description of what we do with public data sets. Uh, data lakes and collaboration is the subtitle for this. Uh, I like to think of it as public data sets that, uh, that, takes research data, sometimes public accessible, sometimes subset accessible by, by the research community, and provides a, a mechanism for the, uh, the storage and the access for that. So if, uh, if you have a large scientific data set, obviously science gateways produce these. Um, uh, and you're constrained around ability, serve it out to users that leads into AWS uh, cloud capabilities around open data sets. Collaborators are downloading uh, many copies of the data. Collaborators need computational resources to analyze the data. All of that can be done inside the capabilities around open data sets plus the AWS cloud capabilities. We can uh, level out peaks of demand and, uh, and build platforms and ecosystems. As we've all done that within the AWS um, Open data set program, and it's a uh, we have uh, a team of data scientists that work on these cap these projects, uh, uh, and it uh, provides a lot of different features, you know, based on, on what's needed for that data set. Uh, whether you're working with NASA or whether you're working with a medical uh, or even patient data, um, we take a look at, at what. The, the data set needs around um, you know excess uh, its sensitivity and compliance issues and I want to look
look at a couple of these real quick. Uh, just, uh, just some tools that are available for data in the cloud. Uh, the open data team uses uh, pretty close to all of these when they when they set up a, or at least they pick what's necessary for each uh, each data set that the, is stored and accessed on AWS. Um, and they look at data ingestion. You know, obviously the protection and security around it. Processing and analytics are out to the right, whether it's uh, it's needed machine learning or just uh, more simple analytics, uh, quick site capabilities, uh, database capabilities around that. And then they, they look at what access and user interface is needed on the front end and the uh, catalog and search capabilities as well across, uh, across that data. They take a holistic approach to providing the, the management and access to that data set. One typical example that uh, that we talk a lot about is NOAA's NextRad system on AWS S3. Uh, I think this is the data set. There was just a Nature article uh, on bird migration, and just using the the NOAA data, they were able to map bird migration in the largest uh, largest map of bird bird migration, the largest, or maybe it was the most granular, I think, uh, bird migration study that they were able to do based on on the existing data that was out in the NOAA public data set. That was uh, September 17th, Nature's uh, article that's out there. Uh, NASA, this is actually, I'm sorry, a repeat slide from earlier. This is the image and video library that's that's found inside the open data set. And let's wrap up with the research cloud program, AWS and the research community. We have a program uh, built inside the public sector area of AWS that looks at the research community and provides capabilities around what we can do um, for the research community. Uh, this is where we help out with the science gateways. This is where we help uh, a, a lone research software engineer in wherever on campus, working in a you know a team of two or three people, uh, up to all the way including, you know, the LHC uh, over at CERN. Um, we do this in a couple different ways. We can certainly help out on different uh, large-scale projects. We provide this book that has uh, our lady researcher on the cover as a part of the research cloud program. Um, if you look at uh, this slide, this is kind of the, the book itself. Uh, there is a link right here. And I think these slides, I may have to pay, pair these slides down just a little bit, but this link will be on there. But it's just aws.amazon.com slash rcp to get a PDF copy of this. And uh, just to give you a quick example of, of what, what it looks like. Uh, it takes, once again, it takes a, a researcher or a user that's never used AWS, gets them to sign on, talks about all the capabilities around research computing inside AWS, goes through all the capabilities, uh, containers, Jupyter Notebooks, uh, goes into all of our partners down here, and continues into some of the consulting partners as well. But it looks at, you know, how do I set up an HPC cluster? And that's just uh, some easy launch templates that are involved there. And then it talks about the different capabilities around it. Gonna, I think we're going to, at least I might help out rewrite the data management portion of this here in a little bit. And lots of links um, and uh, a lot of information inside of that. In general, though, what else does the research cloud program do? Uh, it takes the approach that we're working uh, on science first. We're not thinking about servers. Uh, we don't, we uh, look at the AWS cloud services and how they can be applied to researchers. Um, we look at budget management tools, especially we have some very good partners out there that provide management tools because one of the biggest barriers uh, on the business side of adoption of AWS Cloud is tracking management costs of a project and setting up budgets around it and being able to say, I don't want you know my postgraduate student to eat up my budget 
on a runaway application that can be set up inside of uh, the budget management partner tools that we have. Uh, we talked a little bit about the data egress waiver. Uh, one of the ways we want to uh, take a barrier away from research adoption of AWS Cloud is to set up a program, which we have set up a program that allows uh, data egress to be uh, significantly reduced to probably nothing based on usage for the uh, university. And uh, we look at best practices. A lot of these are built into the book. A lot of these are in, in the, uh, into the uh, applicability of our our people when we look at projects and what we do with them. And a little bit more on that. And I think I'm going to, there's, we have another section on partners, but I think the time is running out. So I think I'm going to call it a, uh, a end here and take any questions at all if there are any left it over. Thanks, Don. Yeah, it's it's after the hour, so some people have been dropping off the call, but um, uh, we could take a few qu uh, questions at this point for, for sure if you want, and we'll also make sure that um, Don and Kevin's emails are also available to those of you who might want to reach out to, it, to them. Um, so uh, currently there aren't any questions, but I'll okay. welcome any any that are coming in, Is there, if there's anybody out there. <laughs> Um, we'll give yeah. you a moment to think about whether to do that. And um, I'm going to share my screen real quick just so um, I can also let you folks know that we do actually have a special edition webinar coming up later this month, uh, on October 24th, about one of the gateways that has help, been helped by SGCI. And then the week before supercomputing on November 7th, a reprise of our um, uh, Gateways 2017 keynote that was about the um, best effective ways of communicating with your audience. So if you want to give a dynamic presentation, you can come and listen to that uh, that keynote um, version as a as a um, webinar style presentation. So um, I am checking and I don't okay. see any chat. Messages coming through with questions. So well, I took some notes uh, on the questions. Uh, I'd be happy to follow up with the answers on those. And I thank everybody yeah. for their time today. Yeah. Well, Don, I want to thank you too for um, putting this together, and uh, especially um, uh, doing it without your your colleague Kevin yeah. on the call with you. So I think this is very useful, and I appreciate um, you making this information available to the community. I think it's a terrific bunch of information to. So, um, and we'll be posting those slides and a recording of this on our website. So thanks again, everyone, for joining us.